I think that's good. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, can we have a massive round of applause for Beef History of Timelessness, Timelessness, precisely. Thank you. Excellent, we're rolling. Okay, what is this? What is this all about? I'll show you this picture first of all. I looked this up uh, on the internet recently, which is a massive network of interconnected computers that spans the entire globe. And, <laughs> it's just like that. <laughs> some people won't know, will they? Uh, they haven't been told, how would you know? So, <laughs> this is uh, Jane Kane, and not a lot of people know that, who is uh, <laughs> the voice of the speaking clock, making the first recordings. So that would be the numbers one, two, and three, obviously. <laughs> when was that? What year was that? Uh, do you know what? I should have put that down, shouldn't I? I'm not entirely sure. I should have looked that up. And is she know. still alive, or is she dead? Um, good questions. So I can see this talk taking quite a while. <laughs> At this rate. <laughs> well, who was she married to? Did she have I don't know. I know she was still alive about 10 or 15 years ago because I phoned up to check. <laughs> and she was fine. But this is her, obviously. She was recording it, wasn't it, Ali Pali? I don't know. It's hard to tell from that picture. Um, I think it was in front of a coffee machine or something. This microphone is a little bit... It's almost certainly before the iPhones and things like that. Um, so I just got that picture because it was nice. She, uh, on the webpage, it said that she had to really just read out, obviously, the numbers 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. They did the hours up to 24, even though the clock doesn't go up to 24, but just in case. So if you phone up, up at midnight, it just says 11.53, you know, and then precisely whatever. And then, so she didn't actually have to record very much at all. She didn't sit there and do the whole lot. <laughs> Can you imagine if she'd done the whole lot and at the end someone goes, why don't you just record 10, 20 and then stick it together afterwards? Oh, yeah. Anyway. Why did they see the need to do that in the first place? Um, well, one of the reasons, let me think, there was a very good reason for this. A lot, a lot of the, the origins of time becoming important it was the Industrial Revolution when suddenly you could have trains going on the same track. And if you had that and you didn't sort out your times correctly, you'd get collisions. Um, before they had very accurate clocks and before it, it mattered, people would set their clocks by the sun being overhead. And that means that even in England, I think you get a five or ten minute discrepancy from one side of the country to the other. Um, but that's a good question, why do they set it up? Uh, I don't know, actually, I think I might have read it and forgotten about it. Um, this little number down here tells us how many slides we've got, and I checked, and it's about 191. So there we go. Moving. <laughs> so, questions at the end. <laughs> Make no mistake, I'm happy to chat about this indefinitely. <laughs> I could, I could out, but yes, there was. Because you've got all the time in the world. All the time in the world. Unfortunately, I don't have enough. Um, what are those end caps on your DNA? We have DNA, and the DNA splits and replicates, and each time it does it, we lose one of the end caps. I can never pronounce the, the name of them. Eric might help me. Um, and that, that's why we die. You know, we wear out. We, there's no such thing as time. We're all here now. This candle isn't going to run out of time. It's going to run out of wax. And that's it. We will get onto this. Slide two. <laughs> so what's this about? Um, and how did it all start? It's about a book that I wrote called A Brief History of Timelessness. Um, which has to do with, a, I guess, an epiphany, if you have that, uh, that I had a while back, where I'd realised everything is happening now. Um, it's a book draft. It's not published. This book is about 500 pages long, uh, 250,000 words. I wrote it in such detail because I wanted to make sure I covered everything. So that if anyone, if I stood in front of a potential publisher or, or some university guys, I, I would know that I'd answer every question that I could possibly think of, proving that there is no such thing as time. I'll bring it out on the Kindle soon. I've got to reduce it in size because this equates to about a thousand pages, something like one too many pages. The picture on the front here um, is a stock photo, but it's of raindrops hitting a, a pond. The reason I chose that is because I'm trying to say that everything is here now. What I realised in the bath, I'll show you a picture of the bath somewhere here. <laughs> uh, I used to have a lot of long baths, kind of seven or eight hours, just topping up the water and just relaxing and meditating. <laughs> what I realised there, I think, was that everything is here now. 
all of our history books, history books that tell us about Henry VIII or anything else like that, is a thing that is here now. And we think it points to the past, but that's what I'm questioning. If you look at this photograph, any one of you here can tell that a ranger almost certainly hit this point here at some time in the past. So by looking at this picture, which is just here now, you feel that you can tell something about the past. You can tell that was a big raindrop, that was a small raindrop, that one happened a while before that one, and so on and so on and so on. But all you're looking at is stuff that is here now. Along with that, you can see that these ripples that spread out are the history of the raindrop. All of the history of anything that happens is, is recorded here somewhere now, in my opinion. But we, when we talk about time, we talk about the past and the future, and we think these things exist. And what I'm trying to show is that there's no need for them to exist. So, I started reading uh, a lot about time and space and stuff like this, and I came across this very famous quote from Albert Einstein, who was a scientist <coughs> that lived a few years ago. <laughs> but we convince physicists the distinction between the past, the present, and the future is only an illusion however persistent. It's a very persistent illusion. And he's saying he thinks that these distinctions, the past and the future, his, all the stuff he worked out kind of told him that this doesn't make sense, but he also thought it does, does make sense. And if I ask any of you here, can you remember the future? You'll say, well, no, of course I can't. Can you remember the past? Well, yes, I can. So these seem to be very distinct things. You know, one that you know about, one that is apparently unchanging, one that apparently hasn't even happened yet. So these are distinct things. There seems to be a distinction between them. But he suspected that it was only an illusion. How did it all start? It's about timelessness. It started when I was having a very hot and relaxing bath and just letting my mind go. My mind kind of stopped. You know, if you have like a gas that is cooled down, it just becomes a liquid. And in my mind, it just felt like there'd been a hoover on for 10,000 years and someone had turned it off. I was going to go, hello, hello, <laughs> anyone there? In my own mind. And at that point, it occurred to me that everything that is happening anywhere and everywhere must be happening now. It's kind of obvious, but if you think about it, the Earth is spinning. Well, of course, all of it's spinning now. You know, this bit doesn't spin, then that bit, then that bit. If there's someone down here asleep or having a cup of coffee, they're doing it now. Any boat that's in the ocean is moving now. Trains are going on tracks, moving now. Even if they're stationary, they'll be vibrating, whatever, all the atoms and anything vibrates. Throughout the cosmos, every single star and every single planet is moving. They cannot be stationary. In fact, if everything in the universe was stationary and I move this, then everything's moving relative to this. So that's all moving. Every single atom in the ocean is moving. All of the waves are forming and rolling and breaking and falling back into the sea. All the fish are swimming. Our minds are doing something. And this is the idea of time and times of the, the past. Along with all that motion, and everything happening now, is the formation of sedimentary layers of rock and fossils. We always think of fossils as a thing in the past. We always think of fossils of dinosaurs that are millions of years old. But of course, they had to be made. So if a fish is lying at the bottom of a riverbed now, and it's been covered up with silt, well, that's a fossil being formed. These are some amazing rock layers, but this is all to do with silt being layered down on a riverbed, and just being built up and up and up. And that's how you get these swirling patterns. Uh, and they kind of go up and down, and when they lay down, they'll be flat because it's just gravity. But as the Earth moves and changes, they change shape. Trees are constantly growing, <coughs> and as they grow, they form this little ring, the stable ring of evidence. And in the summer, this will be lighter, and in the winter, it'll be darker. So, of course, we all know we can cut a tree and count these rings, and this will tell us how old the tree is. But all the trees around us are growing now, everything's being formed now. Even the contents of our own minds, our memories, are changing now. So that's what occurred to me. The next question is, of course, is there a past and a future, or could it just be that everything is here now? That's what we would investigate. Then it occurred to me that we all seem to just assume that everything happens, and all this evidence is created over a thing called time. And when you talk to people, they'll say, oh yeah, that happened over time, or with time, or in time, or through time, or time passed while it happened. And you can never really pin them down, because of course it didn't happen over time. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't it isn't time, isn't down there, and everything happens over it. And it's kind of in time, maybe through time, you know. 
do we go into the future? Does the future come to us? When you try and pin people down the details, they end up saying, well, you know what I mean. And I'm saying, no, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> I think you made it all up. So I began thinking and reading about time. These are all books on time, about 20 books on time. A uh, Brief History of Time at the top there, How to Build a Time Machine, Time Travel in Four Dimensions, or Einstein's Use of the Universe, Introducing Time. This is a book here my sister got me, which is the story of time. It's not about physics, but it's about how mankind looked at the moon passing through the sky, the stars passing through the sky, the sun passing through the sky, the earth spinning, how we built our calendars, how we worked out to have an hour and a minute and a second. Seconds apparently come from our own heartbeat. That's why we've got roughly 60 beats to a minute, because that's the first thing we started using. Um, and with all of these books, I looked at them and I wanted to see if they disproved what I was thinking. And what I was thinking is maybe everything just moves and changed now. The most important thing to realise with that idea is that the contents of your own mind move and change. And when we talk about the past, we actually look at the contents of our mind and we think that that shows us there is another record of events. <clears throat> if you remember something and I remember something, we agree it's in the past, and we talk about the past as if the past exists. The Eiffel Tower exists, the past exists. And it seems to make sense that so we don't question it anymore. Those are those books again, just to prove that I have got them. <laughs> These are the other books that I kind of read about the subject, just on general physics, because with each of those books, I wanted to see at the beginning what their definition of time was and see whether I couldn't respond to it, whether I couldn't get out of whatever they, they proved it was. <coughs> One of the problems with time <coughs> is that when we talk about time, thousands of other topics come into play. We start thinking about it. We start thinking, is there a God? Uh, or perhaps the Buddhist view is correct. Are there aliens? You know, how, will the, how did the universe start? How could the universe end? If a tree falls in a forest and there's no one there to hear it, it doesn't make a sound. Who shot JFK? Who shot JR? Did we really go to the moon? What happens when we die? What if you could go back in the past and kill Hitler? What if you get the lottery numbers from the future? And what I'm saying is I'm just talking about time. Just because all these other questions come up, <coughs> because they seem to be mysterious, it doesn't mean we're talking about the same thing. Does time exist? Does God exist? The two things aren't necessarily linked. So my job is to keep the focus on time. But of course we can't just do that, we have to answer some of the questions. Uh, so of course it was uh, Sue Ellen's sister, Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise we'd be bugging in everyone's mind, we would be concentrating on what is very tricky subjects. <laughs> While reading, I noticed that virtually all of these books, specifically about time, time and the, the space traveller, Paul Davis about time, the birth of time, introducing time, bubbles and voids and bumps in time, uh, on time, the white hole in time, the arrow of time, a shortcut through time, in search of time, time a traveller's guide, all of these books at the beginning either assumed just time just existed or they started by asking does time exist or what is time and that could be a dangerous thing or they had a very basic proof that time could be shown, uh, that time existed I made a lot of these slides this afternoon, I ran out of time. <laughs> they had a very basic proof of time that could be shown to be incorrect if we asked one key question. And this is the question that I came up with to, to summarise it. We're looking at a persistent illusion, almost a perfect illusion, and you will never see through it unless you question it. If you just assume that time exists, everything will look to you as if time exists. You've got no reason to question it. Uh, a good example of a, a similar illusion is when you look at something, you may feel that you're looking at the lamp over there, but really you're looking at an image on the back of your eye. And we all do it, and we all learn it at school, and then we forget it because there's no point remembering it. And it seems not to be the case. It really seems like we're looking at the lamp out there. And there is, of course, a lamp out there. But we can go our whole lives without realising that we only ever see the back of our eyes. Because it doesn't matter, because it's a persistent illusion that works. And as we see, time works perfectly. So the question is, the key question is, if objects in the world could adjust, underline them, could involve, exist, move and interact, would this explain all that we attribute to time? So that's the key question. We'll get questions if question boxes you get asked, and that's what I'll take you back to. You have to ask this thing, I know it seems like time exists, but what if things just exist and move? 
you know, if I put this mouse over here and then I move it over here, well, we all know it was here, but that's because we looked in our heads and we formed memories in our heads. It doesn't prove that there's also another record in the past. And the past is kind of the, the foundation of time. We all assume it's obvious the past exists. If I can show that it doesn't, then that foundation has been rocked. So the question, what if objects in the world can just exist, move and interact, defeats uh, most of the books that I've read. This is Einstein's Relativity and the Meaning of Relativity. This is another very big book called the, uh, Introducing Time. This is one of those books that has a lot of kind of cartoony pictures in it, which make it all very accessible. You know, it's not dense te text or whatever. What Einstein says at the beginning of uh, Relativity is, the experiences of an individual appear to us arranged in a series of events. In this series, the single events which we remember appear to be ordered according to the criterion of earlier and later, which cannot be analysed further. What this guy here is saying is, except in rare circumstances, everyone who has the same information available agrees for the most part on the time order events. There is definitely, definitely something objective and independent of a particular person's feelings about the time ordering. And that seems to make perfect sense and it seems very true. And what this guy says is this is two people who are walking back from a, a basketball game and they're talking about the game. They don't know exactly what time it is, but they can agree that team A scored, then team B scored, then the whistle blew. And you can have a thousand people who will all agree with that. And this is why he's saying there is definitely something objective. You could stick a camera on that, and then you could compare your memory with the camera, and they would tally, and any number of cameras would tally. And I'm saying what he's missed here is that what these people are actually comparing is the record in their minds, and these tally. And if they, carry, if they compare the record in their minds to the record in a video camera or a film camera, it would tally. And then the assumption is that this relates to a thing called time. And I'm saying, what if things just happen? Because if there isn't a past behind us, then there isn't a past behind us. And that's it. And if there isn't a future ahead, there isn't a future ahead. It's just now. So this is where I think he's made a slip up. And in this book, he doesn't say, of course, these people are only comparing the contents of their minds, but another reason to believe time exists is. And Einstein says the same thing here. The single events which we remember appear to be ordered according to the criterion of earlier and later. Of course things happen, and in a sense they happen in an order. But if that order isn't recorded, then it doesn't exist. It's a kind of a weird thing to get your head around, we'll go through it in more detail. So what if objects in the world could just exist, move and interact? Would that explain everything, or does time also exist? Because perhaps things have to move and, and interact, but they also need time. To happen, that's what we'll say. I'll give you a book, can you read it? Yes, but I'll need time. You haven't got time at the moment, blah blah blah. First, here's a test. This is a new test, I haven't used this test before. Um, there's a little bit of debate here. Uh, let's have a general consensus. How many people here think God exists? We start with something easier than time initially. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven people. Not very good at maths. Seven people. Generally speaking, we don't have to go in great detail. Who thinks God doesn't exist? One, two, three, four. Half and half. I don't mind. Half and half is good. That's four. Okay, we got three. That's actually very good. We got three. Uh, four, four, five. Think God does exist? That's fine. That's good. We got to pray to be Just in case. That's good. No, no, that means we've got. Um, <coughs> five and two halves, which is great. That's good. That's that's an open mind policy. Whatever. I find, I'll be honest with you. I find that extremely confusing that you would be in any way divided or doubtful about it. Uh, because I'm absolutely certain that God exists. This is my um, little puppy, um, God. But apparently, some people think he doesn't even exist. Very clearly, he does exist. And some think he's a fundamental expression of the entire universe, which is ridiculous because he's just a puppet. <laughs> The point being, of course, that I unless we define... Sorry? I think he's a bit backward. You think he's a bit backward? Yes, I remember my first drink as well. Okay. I, uh, <laughs> so, where to be ahead of? <clears throat> so, the point being that, of course, I was playing a trick and I didn't define at all what I was talking about, mm -hmm. but we all assumed that we kind of knew roughly what we were talking about. 
And this is another problem with the conversation about time. Is first of all, it hits on all those other topics, which means that when we talk about it, we can get sent down many, many different side roads. And also, if we're not clear about what we mean, we're going down different side roads and we don't, haven't even agreed what we're discussing in the first place, whether this thing exists or not. So the first thing to do is to be clear about what I'm saying time is and what I'm, what I'm saying it is and, and which does not exist. You know, what the general opinion of time is, what the scientific view of time is, and so on and so on. Because in science they don't, <coughs> excuse me, they don't say that things just exist and move. They say there's a future and a past, we might even travel through it, it's walkable, and so on and so on. So if time exists, we need to define what we mean first. Our first conception of time, if you're like me, you probably didn't come up with the idea of time yourself. Your first introduction to time probably came from your parents, yelling bedtime and pointing to a clock. It's a nice picture of a bed. I can imagine that would be quite comfortable, but only if you didn't, if you, if you always slept like that. Otherwise, as soon as you turn over, you'd be like, ah, oh, that's uncomfortable. But a clock is really just a bunch of springs and cogs. And this is one thing that, this is the first kind of layer of abstraction and confusion. We talk about clocks, but a clock is just a motor. You know, it's just a thing that releases energy. It releases energy from a spring that's in here, and it makes these hands go round. But even Einstein says time is that which clocks measure. This is a toy kit clock that I bought, and you can take it apart, so I did take it apart. When you look at it like that, actually you have to build it as a kit, it looks complicated, you know, you, you can't see what you're seeing. But if you break it down, this is a spring, there's a ratchet behind here, so you put the key in there, <coughs> the spring gets round up tighter and tighter and tighter, and it wants to make the red bit unwind. As the red bit unwinds, it'll wind this black cog up like that, and that cog will make the hour hand move this way. Also, the black cog drives this green cog, and the inside bit of the green cog drives the pink cog, and that makes the other hand move. So these three cogs here <coughs> are responsible for making these two hands move at, at different rates. Yeah, you could take these two cogs out and you just have a clock with an hour hand, but it's all driven by the spring. But if you just wound that spring up, it would just unwind very rapidly, it wouldn't be much use to you. So, you have the pendulum. This whole chain of cogs around here is linked to this pendulum. The pendulum's got a couple of little teeth at the top, you can't see them clearly here. As this pendulum swings, it allows this cog to move on a click. As the cog moves on a click, it gives this pendulum a little kick. Otherwise, the pendulum will only swing two or three times, and it would run out because of friction, friction and air resistance. <clears throat> so there's actually a kind of signal going up and down these chain of cogs, and that slows this cog right down in proportion with this pendulum. And pendulum's very important to, to time, as we will see. So when you put it all back together again, I've got that back on there. It's funny, I was looking at that one, I haven't put the pendulum back in here. But when you put it back together, and this is what you see. This thing's trying to drive, it's trying to drive everything. This set here slows it down, this set here shows you what it's doing. You could get rid of these hands and just put some markings on here if you want, it'd be a lot simpler, but whatever. So that's what it is though, it's just a load of springs and cogs that interact. So what really is time? Yeah, but that's only, yeah, but now the other atomic clocks, I mean, you're just big ones. I had one, I was so small, couldn't find it. <laughs> the, yes, we have atomic clocks. And what an atomic clock will do is instead of using a, a crude pendulum like that, it'll use cesium, cesium atoms. And these atoms vibrate at a very, very fast rate. You know, I can't remember, it's, it's trillions of times a second. We still have to work out what we mean by a second. Um, so yeah, they have these cesium clocks. They, and, and atomic clocks, they use them in GPS, we'll get to that. But, but basically, well, you're right, in the core of it, there's something vibrating. And yeah. what I'm trying to say with all these things is, does that prove there's a past, and does it prove there's a future? Because we say that this clock measures time. A cesium clock, a grandfather clock, or a quartz clock, that ultimately it comes down to the same thing. Even the cesium clocks that they use, they link them to a display with hands going around, because that's what we're used to. So I, I get it, I get that we can make hands move, I'm asking what that proves and what it doesn't prove. But yes. Well, but only that can work on Earth though, can't it? If you went out into outer space, yes. you don't have clocks. Or... Oh, you have, you have, this is just, well, or, you know or, the, the Harrison time. This, this will only work in, um, on Earth because it's got a pendulum. Uh, are you saying that there isn't time and space? Or... Yeah. Uh, well, no, if you took a, a, a 
digital watch or a pocket watch or anything like that, it would work. I mean, a heart would work in space, and they send astronauts up there. So all of this is what I'm saying is that all excuse me, a clock is something that moves. I've picked a pendulum clock here because a pendulum is the, the simplest thing. It's what Galileo used. But any clock that you find will have some kind of an oscillator in it, something that repeats the same kind of motion over and over again. Mm. The best thing is the cesium atom because that won't be affected by the outside world very much. You know, these clocks are accurate to something like half a second every billion years, literally something like that. But in space, they use atomic clocks for GPS systems and things like that. So, yeah, you can, yeah, definitely clocks in space. That's, otherwise, they'd have to keep going to the astronauts. When are you coming down? What? Well, at six o'clock. Get your own watch. Speaking clock. <laughs> they would phone up the speaking clock. <laughs> the time on Earth will be. So, on a, a more basic level, let's talk about, we say time consists of the past, the present, and the future. So these little icons, dinosaur for the past, a present for the present, <laughs> and the back to the future car for the future. So we have to look at each of these things and see what they are and what they mean. Time is also said to have a flow and a one-way direction. So it kind of flows from the future through the infinitely thin present into the past. This is what we say, this is what we claim, this is what we generally understand about time. Uh, you know, 1066 there was a battle, it happened, apparently that's sinking into the past now. You know, they're, they're going to launch a new 787 Dreamliner, the latest Boeing aeroplane, that's probably going to happen in the next couple of days, so that apparently will happen in the future. If we stand, we'll see it happen. Also, time is said to have a one-way direction. You know, if we drop a vase, it tends to break, we never really see the opposite happen. The universe is expanding, we don't see it folding in on itself. So, we seem to get older, but we don't get younger. So if we put all those things together, what I'm saying the time is, is it's something that's got a past, a present, and a future, and it's got a flow, and it's got a one-way direction. So would we generally agree that that is the basic outline of time? Oops. Yeah, thermodynamics. Yeah. yeah, thermodynamics. So a cup of tea will get colder rather than hotter. Well, oddly enough, when I was living at home, they just seemed to get hotter now and again. They just appear, a fresh one would appear. But if you Sometimes you have a, if you have a, a sandwich. You can have a star that explodes yeah. and we don't see it, or we keep seeing it yeah. for quite a long time. So it hasn't got, but it's had a past, but we, it hasn't got a present or a future because it's, it's not there anymore. Well, what I'm but, saying, and what, we're still seeing it though, aren't we? I've got which, to... is, which is the present yeah. and the future, isn't it? And the past doesn't exist. Well, that's. I thought it would be yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's um, yeah. you know the, the ripples. I mean, I, there are some slides at the end I can I can use so I put extra slides in. The ripples on a pond. If you imagine a raindrop hits the pond, and that's a little bit like a star exploding. You know, it's making an emission, it's sending this thing out around into the area around it. But if you have a little water boatman on the water, well, as that ripple hits it, it's going to go. Oh my God! I've just detected a raindrop. I can tell. When a star is sending out light, like any one of these candles, as that light hits my eye, I can tell there's a candle. That makes sense? Yeah. Now, if I was a million miles away from this candle, it would, the candle is sending out a shell of light. You know, if it's, it's an easier way of looking at it is if we, if we lit a banger. A banger is going to send out a shell of light. You know, there's some light form, the ball of light grows, but in the middle there's no more light because it's yes. expended itself. That's very similar to a ripple on a pond. So I'm here, if we set off a banger a million miles away, I wouldn't know about it until the light hit me. The light would have to hit me. Then I would see the flash, then the light would go past me. Now I would think that flash is over, but someone down there another million miles still hasn't got it. They haven't seen it yet. So what I'm saying is <clears throat> it's not in the past, it's behind you. It's not in the future, it's in front of you. If you're at a rock concert and you're sitting at the front, you might hear the drama banging away, but someone at the back hasn't heard that yet. Because the sound literally has to be a thing that moves from A to B. But I'll, I'll clarify that more. Don't worry, there's slides on that. It's all here now. It's that simple. That's what I'm saying. We'll get there. The past. Break the sound a little bit more. We say the past exists because things clearly happen and have clearly happened that are not happening now. I picked the 1966 World Cup. Would we all agree it happened and that we're not winning World Cups now? 
that's an example. Is that similar to what you're, you're saying? Things, because this, how do we know this happened if the past doesn't exist? Don't worry, we're moving on. So I'm saying this is what we define as the past. We can see that we won the World Cup. We can't see if we're going to win it over the next few years. And we can remember these events. So someone who was actually there will remember this thing happening. You know, we will remember where we were when the Twin Towers fell or something like that or when we first heard about it. So that's the definition of the past. We say well, the won't remember it in, in the same detail. The two people there <coughs> yes. will have a different perspective. Perspective, on yes. Because it depends on where they were at the time, but they were in the ground. Yeah. So they won't remember it exactly the same, will they? No, everyone will have a different view on it. And also, you know, however we record it, that medium's going to disintegrate. You know, it's interesting that we, we get integrated circuits, but of course they disintegrate. So we could have a video camera, we could get the best recording system you want and film any event, but you've got to put that film somewhere, and wherever you put it, someone's going to tread on it or... It will decay. Yeah. It will, it has to decay. Of course, if everything's decaying, it makes you wonder why the clouds are still white. I always thought it should be grey by now. <laughs> How come tomatoes, bananas and babies look so young if everything's decaying? There's something more to this. We say that the present exists because we can constantly see it. And this, of course, is a group of people constantly seeing the present. We say the future exists because we know things will happen that aren't happening now that we sometimes can or cannot predict, predict, pre-ahead, dict, to say, to say ahead. We don't know what the weather's going to be like. We know if we're going to win the lottery, but someone's going to win it. We do know that we're heading for a wooden box. Thank God, be hell if this thing went on forever. We say time has a flow and a direction because we're born, we live, and we die. It's a very rare picture of Albert Einstein as a baby. Uh, of course, the epiphany of living, volleyball, and where we're going to end up. Skip in a night follows day, day follows night, spring, summer, autumn, winter, all happen in order. No one would deny that. But what do the experts think? And this is a picture from The Simpsons when they were speculating about the so-called third dimension, which of course in Simpsons world doesn't exist. <laughs> they were wondering if it did. Galileo, this is the beginning of time. This is the beginning of scientific time. We can all look at the, the stars and stuff like that and we would tell you things change, but this is the guy who started really looking into it. Uh, Stephen Hawking says, Galileo, perhaps more than any other single person, was responsible for the birth of modern science because he kept careful notes, because he made repeatable experiments. Um, and he did a lot of good mathematics, I assume. And in my opinion, he's probably the guy who gave the birth of real time as well. Because he started working with pendulums, he was in the cathedral in, Pe in Pisa, sitting through a very boring sermon, I assume, and he was watching the lanterns swing and had these very long lanterns that are very heavy in a very uh, large church or cathedral. And of course the doors are closed and there's no draft. So these pendulums become very accurate oscillators. And he was comparing the pendulum swing to his own pulse. And because it was a boring sermon, his old pulse wasn't racing too much. So and then God said, yeah, what did he say? <laughs> And what he found was when the lanterns were set off swinging, it might take, say, five pulses for the lantern to complete an uh, entire swing. But even as they wound down, these, even as their, their reach got less and less and less, it still took five pulses. And that is kind of unexpected. You'd expect it to take less time, so to speak. Um, but that's the fundamental feature of the pendulums. And suddenly that meant you could create very accurate measurements of other forms of motion. So what he did was he set up pendulums, or in fact he used water clocks, and I'll explain about that in a second, and he would get balls or projectiles and roll them on ramps. The reason he used ramps is if you just check a, chuck a stone into the air and you want to see how it flies, you know, they didn't know how things fly, did they accelerate all the way or, or same speed or whatever. If you chuck a ball in the air, you can't really tell what it's doing, it's going too quick, but if you make a big, flat, smooth ramp, you can mimic that motion, and you can compare it to the swing of a pendulum. And that's a stroke of genius to do that. You know, suddenly, in the middle of uh, a field back in, well, 1642, whatever, 1500s, um, he was able to start doing very accurate results. You can just scale the thing up. You can make a bigger, heavier pendulum, a bigger ramp. You can get surprisingly accurate results, even back then, without a single decent clock or anything like it. He probably used water clocks instead of pendulums. With a water clock, you just make, for his work, a container of water with a hole, you put your thumb over the hole, then you set your, your apparatus off and you release 
the water and you stop the water when you want to stop it. And what happens then is you've got another bucket of water which you can weigh, which is a brilliant thing to do. You just weigh that thing, oh, it must have taken 10 seconds, whatever, you're just comparing motion. As he did this kind of experiment, he would have been counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. He'd been counting the swing of the pendulum. And I think this is the origin of the idea that there's a thing called time that progresses one, two, three, four. And it progresses in an unusual way. It's not going along this way or up that way or through that way. It seems to be happening in a, a direction that doesn't matter. It seems to be happening constantly. It seems to be happening forwards because we're doing it. That's the thing. So this seems to be the origin of the idea of a linear flow of some ethereal extra dimension, if you will. What he could have done, instead of using a pendulum or water clock, is he could have made a kind of a ramp with numbers. And then he could compare any other projectile to this ramp with numbers. And then we would have looked at it and we'd have gone, oh, I see what you do. You're just comparing one form of motion to another form of motion. And that's what I think anyone who's talking about time is always doing. They're just comparing two forms of motion. This wouldn't really work exactly because the ball would speed up, but you could do other things. You could get a mate to walk along a track at a steady rate. Or you could put this in a circle and get to walk in a circle so that you never had to make a ramp that was too long. If he did that, he'd have said, that's easier and it doesn't suggest a mysterious extra dimension. What you want is one very simple form of motion, and then you can compare it to more complicated forms of motion. <coughs> Isaac Newton found the classical mechanics on the view that Time is something that passes uniformly without regard to whatever happens in the world. So we get that feeling anyway. Time just goes on whatever you do. Time is the dimension of the universe which, in which events occur in sequence. So we've got this idea of sequence again. But again, we're talking about time is. Time was. Time being a thing. Essentially, you believe that time was as real as the objects that it contains. And it could be measured. And what I'm saying is this is the start of the Emperor's New Clothes. Because no one ever saw this thing called time. All we saw is that things move and they change and we can compare them. Then we come up with this idea of a number that's constantly progressing and then we start talking about what time is. And I think that's a bit risky. Einstein says space and time are one thing, warpable space and time. I won't go into too much detail there. Stephen Hawking says that different areas of space and time may be linked by wormholes. The idea here is that if you get a big mass, it will warp space. And if you extend this idea, you get the idea that different areas of space and time, because Einstein says they're linked, could be linked in a very unusual way. This journey here might be 20 billion kilometers, but through here, it might literally just be a thousand kilometers, because they've warped and bent space, which is fair enough. I agree with the idea that space can warp, but they're saying that this might be a different time. And I'm saying it will not be a different time, because you've got no reason to believe the past exists, no reason to believe there's a flow of anything. We seem to have just assumed it and jumped to a conclusion. Um, Wikipedia says time travel. One way time travel in the future is arguably possible. Backwards time travel, it's unknown whether it's possible. But they're not saying there's no such thing as time. They're saying, well, maybe we could travel into the future. You can't travel into the future unless the future is a thing. It's not just an idea, it's a thing. You can't travel backwards in time unless time is a thing. So what I'm trying to point out is that the professional view is that time is a thing that does exist in some way. When I talk to a lot of people, half my friends think that it's obvious time doesn't exist, and the other half think it's obvious time does exist. And none of them think I should have bothered writing the book. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Hawking at the end of the lecture says, the conclusion of this lecture is that rapid space travel or travel back in time can't be ruled out. So he's saying travel back in time can't be ruled out. So he must think that time exists and that maybe we could travel through it. So I'm trying to show you that people have a very strong idea that this is a very real thing. And I'm trying to say the whole purpose of this talk is that I can show you that time does not exist at all, that there's no future, there's no past, just everything's changing now. And people will look at that and they'll say, oh, that's the same thing, but I'll explain that it isn't. If you look on Wikipedia, Mysteries of Time, 53 million hits, Time Travel, 245 million hits. So a lot of people think time is a real thing and that it's mysterious and that you might be able to travel through it. Even in Birmingham. A third of the people believe time travel is real and not confined to TV shows, says a poll for Birmingham Science City, so it must be true. That's a joke. Uh, time travel films, there are 200 pages of time travel films on Wikipedia. So, let's have a look at... I'll point them out for um, <laughs> So what he's saying is, look, what, what would happen? What if this guy could kind of cut through time, you know? And um, what if he... Uh, 
he went into the future and shot himself before he assembled the gun that he used to shoot himself. This is a paradox, a paradox that gives cosmologists nightmares. And I'm saying this is the kind of paradox I can solve for you because it can't happen. It's always now, it's a misunderstanding. What's interesting with this, uh, this setup here is they didn't have a camera from above because if they had a camera from above then you'd be able to see just when that one bloke became two, which is the most interesting bit, surely. Anyway. So I put that there so that you can see just the, the seriousness of, of you know, what people think time is, because it's so easy and it frustrates me a lot when people casually say, oh, it's obvious it doesn't exist. You know, if you think it's obvious it doesn't exist, then you're saying that Einstein, Galileo, Newton, Feynman, Hawking, all these people are wrong. So it's important to realise why they think it exists. We say time exists is more of an idea than an idea, because it has these distinct features. There's a constantly receding and accumulating past that we can see but we can't change, clearly visible present which seems to keep happening, a future which seems to constantly arrive but is somewhat unpredictable, there's an apparent flow, direction and order. So all of these are distinctions about time and yet Einstein was saying I think these distinctions might be a persistent illusion and that's what I'm going to try and prove to you. The experts seem to agree that time exists and is mysterious, it's real, it's part of space-time, it can be warped or dilated, we're not going to cover too much of that, maybe a little bit, and it may be travelled through, forwards or backwards. So they're not just saying it's a word, they're saying there's a lot more to it. So that's what I mean by the word time. So now, because I was trying to trick you with that thing about God, because we didn't define what we meant, so now who thinks time exists or does not exist? We've got seven people here, you can be undecided, I don't mind. Uh, who thinks time obviously exists in some way or another? One, two, three, four, good. Who thinks time doesn't exist? One, and who's undecided? Two, okay, so we've got four, one, two, that's good. They, they mix up. So now I'm going to try and clarify that, I'm going to simplify and clarify it. But now we've got, we've got a, an opinion. I always forget who it is that said they did, because people change their minds, they're so annoying. Is there an intermission or a natural break coming up? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> would you, we can have one now if you want. Let's do that. So that's now we've, I've clarified what it is that, you know, that I'm saying time is. Just think about it for a while. And now I'm going to, after this 10, 15 minute break, I will completely wipe that. Round of applause for the first half. As, you can, as if I had to work. Thanks, guys.